sometimes I get caught up in like comparing, but sometimes I got to remember or remind myself like, hey, you know, Grant Cardone's 62 years old or 63 years yeah, old. Yeah, something like that, yeah. Justin Spaulding is 30, 33 years old. Yeah. You yeah. know, and so to think that you have, man, th- he has 30 years on you. Yeah. And where was where was Grant Cardone at 33? Was, you're was, well ahead of him. I was, I was on Instagram you know live with mean? him like two or three years ago, something like that. He's like, dude, you're at 300. It was when I was at 300 units, so remember that was. He's like, dude, you are, he's like, you're 35 years ahead of me. He's like, you don't realize that. And I, I thought about that because I was 28 at that time. So this was five years ago. I was 28 at that time. I'm like, oh, holy shit. It will be interesting to see. So we're going through uh, a couple refinances right now. Timber Creek Apartments, which is 145 units out in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. And also the Arborist Townhomes, which is 150 units also in Greensboro. We bought them generally in the same time frame, spring, summer of 21. But same thing. We bought them on Freddie Mac floaters. Intro rate was 2.7 on one property. The other one was 2.38. We bought a 200 basis uh, point rate cap, meaning, hey, you know, if the rate goes up 200 basis points plus the 2.7, we'd be fine. But as you alluded to with your deal, um, you have two deals right now that you're refined or just one? Uh, we have a couple that were refined, a couple, but the yeah. one, the one is the one that's on the that's floater. Like, yeah. And at the time, that was the the sophisticated, savvy investor was going with the floater because, if you remember a couple years back, people that had these hefty prepayment fixed debt yield maintenance deals, yeah. and they were trying to sell when the rates were so low, it was killing a lot of deals because there'd be like a seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollar prepayment penalty. Well, yeah, and it was killing Depending deals. How big the deal was? It was millions of dollars. Yeah, or it was millions, a big deal. right? And so if you were buying a value add deal, not only would you get a lower rate, but you would also have a 1% prepayment penalty and yep. you knew, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna double the NOI. Or, or or yeah, the yield maintenance, the yield maintenance would be way bigger than the one percent though. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So when, you know, in early 21, when you when you bought yours um and we bought these, it was actually the smart move at the time, based on the information and the data that we had, to do a Freddie Mac floating rate yeah. mortgage, one percent prepayment penalty. Great, we have the option to refi or even sell, um, and not have that big prepayment penalty. And then you you hedge your risk. You buy a interest rate cap. Um, I think going back, maybe we would have bought a three hundred basis point cap versus yeah. a two hundred. Yeah. Um, Which and- so for the people that don't know what a cap is, is basically you're insuring against the interest rate going so high. Mm-hmm. So like basically if, a, if, if, Rich, if Rich buys a cap at, you know, what we don't need to get into details, but if he buys a cap, he's basically paying today to be able to have insurance that in case the interest rate goes above X, mm-hmm. he's gonna then get a check back after he pays that mortgage payment, or it's just gonna be reduced and he doesn't have to, he doesn't have to pay that full interest amount if it goes above X interest rate. Exactly, and so that's on. those expire. Yes. So those last, like, they can be a year long. And yep. the longer you buy them for, the more they cost, mm-hmm. right? Because it's more insurance. But you can buy them for one year. A lot of people are buying two years. Mm-hmm. I, we bought two years. Same. Know, what, and, and those, so the, a lot of those expire this year. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. And so I think what saved you and, and what saved us is we were able to, well, first of all, we, we bought it right. We didn't, we didn't pay right. a two cap. But we were able to execute on our business plan yeah. and we underwrote for $150 rent increases, but we were able to get 300 plus. And so all of that movement and NOI growth um, allows us to, even though we're in a higher interest rate environment, still refi. And now the values are much higher than what we paid for these assets. And so we're still able to refi and have a nice you cash have, out and get the debt in debt coverage to be able to still the cash debt coverage out. is yep. there. Yes. Yep. So, and so, so, the, but, so last week when I saw this, we were still going to be able to take like $2 million out of that property cash. Mm-hmm. But now I'm going to have to call Ralph and be like, dude, what's going on today? Where are we at? Because we're probably more of like, okay, maybe 200,000, but his things know, are moving. So, so we were at a point though, I was like to the point, I'm like, okay, well, if I have to put in, if we got to put in 500 to a million dollars to get a different loan, like we'll find a way to do it. Yeah. We have cash. It's like, that's another thing is we're capital. We have cash and access to cash um, that wouldn't liquidate our investors and everything because we could loan the, loan it to the property or whatever. So we have other options too. Obviously, we do, we would much rather have the cash out, fix the rate, it'd yeah. be a much lovelier uh, situation. But for all the other operators that didn't buy right and they weren't able to achieve the rent growth assumptions that they were underwriting for, and let's say they're looking to refi right now and they're not able to cover that DSCR and they're looking to have to either do a capital call or get creative and bring their own money into the deal in order to but refi. a lot of the guys that were raising the tricky. money don't have their own money or the GP group yes. doesn't have because they were after the quick fee mm-hmm. and they blew it and on a car and just put it into fees, that deal yes. and it's gone, you know, whatever. And so what are those groups going to do and how are those, are those deals going to come to market? Like, what are we going right. to see there? That's, that's what I'm right. curious or about. Or are they going to be recapped by another group like we were talking about before? I was talking to a guy after uh, the multifamily housing, what, the NMHC? Yeah. Uh, after that event, 
Um, Which one did you go to? I didn't. I didn't go to one, but okay. I talked to a lot of the guys that uh, that were out there in Vegas. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was one guy that said there's a group, and I don't know. He, so I don't know if this is true or not because this is one guy. But there's a group that has like 15 billion dollars waiting to do recaps. Wow, I'm like that's a lot of money to do recaps. <laughs> yeah. so I get that, you know. But there's always um, a guy for every situation, right, right? So, but again, if you go the recap route, you as the GP, you're gonna get your legs cut off, and so are all your investors if you go that way. Yeah, you're probably not gonna it raise money a, for another deal for a very long a while. time. Yeah, a, yeah, potentially a while, unless you're Adam. Newman. And rightfully so. I mean, if you, because uh, I want to be able to sleep good at night, so. Uh, if if you take someone's money uh, and the deal goes south, you don't deserve to do another deal until you prove that you can be a good custodian yep. of someone's money. Yep. You know. But I always tell our investors, I'm like, they're they're always like, how sure are you this deal? I'm like, well, between me and my and my like my family loves to invest in in these deals, and so yeah. so they 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 put money in with us too, and my dad's a, you know one of our main partners as well, and whatever. But people are like, how sure are you? Well, my family's putting in 500, or you know what? I mean, we're we're, we're sure, but. If I keep doing deals, I mean, at some point, if I do 100 deals, is one going to maybe go sideways? I don't know. Probably. Mm -hmm. So I'm also waiting for the time when, you know, I do have to eat my words a little bit, too. And hopefully it's not this one I'm talking about right now that we're trying to refinance out of. But sure. at some point, you but, do enough deals, you might. But yeah, right. For sure. Um, but if you're a good operator and you had 15 deals go good and you have one that didn't, well, if you have capital... A good right. operator will actually right. back up his own out. word yeah. and he will put his own money into the deal yeah. to make the investors whole. Yeah. And I think that yeah. goes even further sure. than having yeah. a deal that just goes good. Yeah. You know? Because now too investors know who they're who they're with. And this is the thing is I've had opportunities to take checks from other people that I'm like, you know what? I I don't want your five hundred or two million or four million bucks because I feel like you might be someone that and this was like two years ago, that, that might come after me and break my legs. That was just the vibe that mm -hmm. I got talking to him. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm glad I didn't. What made you feel that way? I just, I don't know, man. I get these feelings. Like when I show up to a property, like you get it. Like when you show up to a property, you just know that that's the property you got to have. Or you'd be like, I don't want this one, right? Sure. Well, I get the same thing with investors. And I'm like, I don't I don't want your money. <laughs> I don't want your money because I'm not getting the, I feel like you're going to come hunt me down in my sleep if, because that could happen. I, I mean, get it. So it's been really cool is we have, we have a group that invests with us and they've got, they've probably got 20 million bucks with us. And, um ballpark but and they got a ton of experience so they've been they've been great to work with like they're lps so like they don't have any but i still will go to them and say hey here's the situation like what do you guys think because of all their knowledge and they've been great to work through to work through these deals with which i'm so thankful like and i always wonder i always wondered about them a little bit too okay if something goes a little bit ugly what's gonna happen mm -hmm. right and they're in on this deal that i was just talking about and they're like you know hey sometimes you do get a dog Mm -hmm. I'm like, wow, like that. So now obviously we're hoping it's not actual dog. We still love the project long term. We still love the location. We still love the property. But when I heard those words, the first time that I brought this up, like saying just, hey, you know, we got to pause distributions here for a little bit because we got to figure out what's going on. This was back in October. And they like 100% had my back. And I was like, oh, this is like, this is what I want in partnerships. And this is why I didn't go, you know, take these other people's money because you don't know what you're always getting into. Not all money is good money. And I totally get that. Not just investor capital, but also could be a client. Um, because you got to think about the potential headaches that yeah. you're going to have to deal with. Yeah. Um, not every personality is a pleasant personality to deal with. And I, I've realized that as as we've grown. And um, some some things are just not worth your time. You know, and it's all about the 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 return on my time at least and my team's time i don't want my team to be dealing with a bunch of headaches either For so sure. um if i if i don't have a good feeling in my gut about working with a potential uh, investor or a client i'm like hey you know what let's not do it yep. because we don't we're not yes people yep. you know we're we're investors first and second we will manage and operate for other people but we're not we're not yes people yep. by any means you yep. know what i mean yeah and that's and that's me too i mean i've got i mean 96 percent of my wealth is in the, and money is in all these money and it is in all these deals with the investors too i mean like i'm writing a bit as big of a check that i can write and like i'm going to like zero for a while in my bank mm -hmm. accounts i think i got that from watching grant Carter. but that's just like what i've done you know um and i've done that every time because i'm i'm convicted so much on the deals that we're buying that it's like i want to go all in and as my family's built more wealth like I've got my sister like, okay, I, I can do, my sister's like, I can do 40 on this one. I can do 60. Like, and, nice. she's, and she's like going all in, you know? Nice. And it's um, so like my family has a lot riding on these things too, which I don't know how many other groups are like that as well. How much of their own money is, is in it? I don't, I don't know. Uh, but we, we have a lot of skin, skin, a lot of our own skin in the game. 
Yeah, I think that's um, that's an important thing for like any limited partner out there is like make sure you know who you're investing with. Yeah. Um, and if it's someone that you don't know personally, uh, it'd be smart for you to talk to some of their other past investors, get on a phone call with them. And if they don't want to introduce you to any past investors, that's a red flag. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Know. Which is funny though. I've, I don't know that I've had any investor talk to a past other than we get a ton of guys. I have never even talked to some of our investors because mm -hmm. there'll be referrals from some of our other guys and I'll try to reach out and the guy will end up just texting me back or emailing me back. So I'll leave a voicemail. Like I don't, I'm good. I trust. X, who's our current investor, I trust him. If it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me, mm -hmm. which is kind of crazy to think about. But but um, that goes to say, like with your track record, you're on social media. It's not like you're hiding. Like people right. know where to find you. Yeah. People see you on other people's podcasts. You're yeah. putting out content every single day. Yeah. You're very transparent. Yeah. And by doing those things, and obviously you got a, a tremendous track record now. By doing those things, people just trust you, right? Yeah, I but, mean, it's like your new ID, right? Yeah, you don't, if, you don't have to show them your ID card anymore yeah. because you're on Instagram. You're on you you. you you know, again, you can't, but if you're so consistent with it, like mm -hmm. we are, that it for sure adds a ton of credibility. But on the flip side, like there's a lot of old school uh, apartment multifamily syndicators, like my, uh, our co-sponsor out in North Carolina and my mentor, Tony Azar, he's old school. Yeah. Uh, he's got, you know, uh, he's transacted north of 8,000 apartment units. They've, it's, they've been sellers over the last great. three years, but they, they still own about 4,500 units. He's got two private Big jets, time, yeah. awesome. but no one knows who he is, right? He's yeah. not, on, he's not on social media. Yeah. He's not out doing podcasts. And so when you're meeting an operator for the first time and this guy's not on social media, he's not yep. anywhere to be found, I think that's where you might want to reach out and maybe talk to some uh, past investors first, sure. right? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I don't know. It's interesting, man. I think now, and I, I talk about this all the time, I think in today's age that we live in, there's never been a better time to be an entrepreneur. And us as real estate investors, we have some, you know, it, it's a good recipe for success because you're investing in tangible assets yeah. um, that are never going to go anywhere. But we have the ability to put out content. We have the ability to hit all these different platforms, which is utilizing a form of leverage. I mean, us having this conversation right now is a form of leverage, right? Sure. Yeah. Uh, if we were just conversating right now and there was no cameras, there was no microphones, we wouldn't be utilizing any sort of leverage. Yeah. But now we have the mics, we have the cameras, and now this goes out on Apple Podcasts, it goes out on Spotify, you chop YouTube, it up and it's a, chop it up into shorts, yeah. now it goes out on Instagram yeah. and all these different platforms. And it can, you know, these pieces can go viral and, and now you're in front of, you know, hundreds of thousands of eyeballs. That is a form of leverage. And so I think in today's age, it's never been easier as an entrepreneur, especially a real estate investor entrepreneur sure. to make some moves. And, you know, we're seeing a lot of, um, you know, a lot of talks of recession out there. We're seeing a lot of tech companies doing layoffs right now. And I told the team the other day, I said, look, like people are contracting right now. People are cutting back on their marketing budget. People are doing layoffs. But I said, look, we're not laying anyone off right now. This is where we're going to double down on marketing. We're going to double down on the content. And this is where we're going to play offense and we're going to play to win the game. Mm -hmm. Because I think right now is an opportunity when there's fear in the marketplace, yeah. if you're savvy right now, you can go out there and kill it. It's, and this is where and we're going to make our moves. The, and this is the cycle, right? And this is why in 2012, when I when I was obsessed with reading real estate books and then when I bought my first deal. So again, 09 to 2012, people were trying to talk me out of it because we were coming out of the recession. Mm -hmm. I was buying deals. Then 2015 to 2017 happens and people are like, uh, oh, you sure? Like, and now I was like scaling, buying bigger deals. That like, okay, you sure you're gonna like? That's a big loan. You want you want to do that? They were kind of question. Then it became, then it became for like a short window. Yeah, buy, buy, buy. But then like, then it got to a point. Obviously, like 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021. It's right, like we're overdue. Yeah, no, everyone's then like, okay, everything's too expensive. Yeah, it's not the right time. Everything's too expensive, right? Well, then they pump all this money in, and like you get the inflation, right? So we have a deal go from 33 million to being valued at 45 million. 18 months after we buy it. But then in 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 20, you know, late 2021, 2022, then the excuse was interest rates. Interest rates, interest rates. So like the crazy thing is is like I, I'm someone that you should just be buying deals all the time. Number one, because like when you truly get to the point where like you have a lot of income, you want to buy deals so you can have some new cost segregation mm -hmm. to offset your income for that year. But you always want to be playing offense. There's always opportunity out there. It's just that so many people make the make the excuse or, you know, they're 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 listening to the people that are just pumping the fear out. And, and it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be aware and you shouldn't just close your eyes and pray that you're going to get a lucky deal. Yeah. But you just got to be able to, like, block out a lot of that noise and focus on the fundamentals of the situation 
and then pull up, pull the trigger on the deals that are cash flow positive day one in an area that you love with a debt that's a good debt plan for you, for you and the property um, and do the deal. I agree. And I also think, and, and you invest know, for the long term. Don't do it. If you're, if you're only in a two year window, you're going to run into problems. If you're investing for 15 years, now yes. you got a longer runway to make mistakes. Yeah. Hey guys, real quick, I hope that you're finding value in this show. If you could do me a huge favor and drop a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or whichever platform you're listening on, it would mean the world to me. Also, if you know of anyone that would potentially benefit from this podcast, feel free to share it with them so we can help more people build wealth through real estate investing. Now back to the show. I also think like that the time of the cycle determines what kind of deal you can buy. So, you know, when we're in a period where there's a lot of runway, there's a lot of rent growth um, and asset values are jumping every single year, it's okay to buy something turnkey. If people were buying class A product like Grant Cardone, he's buying a lot of class yeah. A stuff and just getting tremendous rent growth and just kind of riding it out and letting yeah. time do its thing. Yeah. But right now, where we're in this volatile interest rate environment, cap rates are going up a little bit, the market is softening, right now you can't buy those kind of deals where there's no value to to be added. Mm -hmm. And so I think right now you gotta know, hey, in order for me to do a deal right now, I gotta buy something where I can add value and I know I can buy it at a discount because that's gonna give me a cushion and a margin for air should the market continue to soften. Yeah. And then the last thing you said is, is, and I resonate this with this, is you gotta get some long-term debt and you gotta secure something to where you have a nice window to yeah. where you're not forced to sell a refi in yeah. an inopportune time in the market cycle. Yeah. I'm getting paid $200,000 right now to buy an 18 unit. I'm getting paid. Dude, tell me about this deal. Let's talk about I it. I saw you post on your social media. So there's, media. there's some new nuances that, that, that uh, I don't even know, Leon, I don't think I told you everything, but um, so some new nuances that, so I got this deal and I got, I got this call in this market that we, that we operate in, whatever. And um, I've been starting to see this more and more, by the way, where there's deals under 80 or 100 units, at least in the Midwest, that people are open for seller financing right now. They're at least listening to the conversation. I haven't done a seller financing deal in real estate since 2015. I did do a business that was uh, seller financed in 2018. But <clears throat> um, this guy reached out, left the voicemail on our company phone. Uh, someone at the office let me know there was a voicemail for me. I immediately call him back. He owns 18 units in a market that we already operate. We already got 500 units like right around the corner. And uh, I call him back. We, we go, we look at the property. My first question is, well, how much debt do you have on the property? One of my first questions, how much debt do you have on this? He's mm -hmm. like, none. And so I'm like, right away, I'm like, nice, like, no, Great no candidate. Debt. Yeah. And so then I'm like, would you consider 100% seller financing? And he goes, yeah, depending on the terms, yeah. So like we hashed it out over a couple of days, you know, a couple of emails back and forth, a couple of phone calls. And so what it came down to was uh, for 18 units, $1.45 million, 6.5% interest rate, which we went back and forth. I started at like five. He started at like seven and a half. We, we were at six and a half interest rate. Amortization, 30 years, five-year balloon. I negotiated three years of interest only. But here's the best part. You want to know the best part? What's that? The best part is that there's 15 months of deferred payments. Wow. So That's insane. So I have $10,000 of earnest money. So um, $10,000 of earnest money. And what this guy doesn't really realize probably yet, but he's probably going to have to write me a check at closing because of the prorated real estate taxes, the security deposits, and, and rent. So like if that's... If that's a big issue, I'll be like, okay, here's, let's, I don't want you to have to write me a check if that's going to be, but he might have to write me a check at closing to be able to do that. Right. right. Which so, is we, cool. so, we, so we get that rock and rolling. It's cash flow positive day one, even if we were to pay, pay him the interest only, but his rents are, you know, $600 a month. I'm renting stuff right around the corner for $1,100 a month. Um, now we're going to have to go in and this is part of the reason like, you know, he's getting a good overall good price because if a bank were to, if someone were to go in off the street, go get a, a bank wouldn't do 1.45 right now, unless you're going to put probably 35% down. Right? right. It's like, he's overall getting a pretty good deal for the interest rate. He's going to have some capital gains, helps, helps capital gains a little bit with the seller financing, but we're going to go in, we're, you know, day one, we'll do the new, the common areas, the, the, you know, the flooring, the lights, the paint, literally days one through five, somewhere in there. Uh, we'll fix up, clean up the landscaping a little bit, not do anything crazy, but trim it up, pull out anything dead, put some new mulch down, and then we'll start giving out rent increases. Now I can be pretty aggressive here. I got no debt payments on it for 15 months. I yeah. can be pretty aggressive. Right. And uh, who, cares if we cause, if you, who cares if you got some turnover? If we cause 50% turnover, okay, well, because they're all month-to-month -month leases right now. So I got yeah. 30 days notice and they're... And then we can go in and do the flooring of the units, the paint, the appliances. That's really all we'll have to do. And we'll get that. We'll get between $1,000 and $1,100 a month. And the property, if we you know, do that, we'll have to put in $150,000, $185,000. And the property will be worth two point one. 
Mm-hmm. And I think we can do it in three to six months. I think we can turn this one really fast. Um, now, the interesting thing is how I'm going to get paid $200,000. So it was really hard. It's like me and my dad have always done business together, like always, and a lot of different things. And he was a veterinarian by trade. We rolled together 40 veterinary clinics across the country. We ended up selling that to a, a subsidiary of one of the oldest private equity companies from New York um, in 2020. And, um, and so he's always invested something into our deals. He's a GP on some of our deals. And, uh, and so I call him. I said, hey, we got this 18 unit seller financing so he was like jacked he's like yeah "Yeah." like and then i said yeah i'm gonna buy this one by myself and like he didn't Uh like he's always supportive like super supportive so he didn't say anything but then it started to eat at me and then one of our advisors and one of my mentors came to town it was uh just last week he's like dude like i've seen families get ruined over stupid shit like this he's like don't he's like find a way to make work i'm like well how should we make this work i don't need any money to close the deal right like and so he's like we'll just take some type of fee up front so then you, that you can still double their money over a three-year period. I'm like, okay, yeah. Because I was set to make $700,000 on this deal with my math over three years. With a cash-out refi? With a cash-out refi. or it'd, That'd probably be a sale scenario okay. because I've, I've kind of levered pretty high right You're now. You're going to create far. 700K equity, basically. Yeah. Okay. So I'd probably at that point, three years from now, this is when I'd view it if I was selling, if I was owning it myself. I'd be like, I'd sell it, unlock it, go do something else, right? Because it'd give me $700,000. $700, and really, like, we already got the overhead there. We already got the operations there. I'm going to have a total of like 25 hours into this thing. I mean, it's not like a crazy. So people are like, why are you messing with 18? And I'm like, because it's $750,000 for 20 hours. Yeah. Uh, I like the small deals too, man. <laughs> like, I like, like the small deals too. Like, And it's right next to our already operating. And so uh, so then I'm like, all right, what? how can we? So I'm like, you know, I got my got my Excel model out. And I'm just playing around with stuff. I'm like, well, if we raise, you know, like $300,000, I can basically take a $200,000 fee. Plus I'll take 20% off the top. So I get 20% of the equity. I'll get a $200,000 fee. And uh, my family's going to be in on the deal. They'll double their money in about three years. It'll return about 18% year one to them. Uh, so it's a great deal for everybody at that point. Yeah. Now, I'm only going to make, instead of making this 700-ish over three years, I'm going to make like 400 because I'm also going to buy in. And I'll probably, I'll probably put in another 50 or 75 myself as well to buy in more as well. But instead of making the 700, I'm going to make the 400 over those three years. But I get the 200 up front. So now I start. To, I can go start playing offense with that money. And someone's like, "Well, yeah, you got to pay tax on that." No, I don't. I'm gonna go find a deal, and I'm gonna cost segregate. I'm not gonna have to pay tax on that 200 that I take as a fee. Right. I'm gonna. I'm gonna find something that'll offset my taxes on it. And not to mention, you got all these other assets with cost segs on them. Yeah. And so you just have all this depreciation, yeah. and it adds up over time. Yeah. 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 So I'm gonna get paid two hundred thousand dollars. It'll pay. You know. I mean, for for doing that. And then we we've got a couple other deals that are that are kind of looking like you know, again, all under 80 units that people are entertaining. I don't know that they're going to happen, but people are entertaining seller financing. What's this bigger deal that you were alluding to on your social? Uh, cause it, it was the 18 unit that you got a hundred percent, which those, those terms are phenomenal by the way. So and the, I love real quick. I love that you started with a hundred percent. It's like, Hey, what are the chances you get to well, yeah, hundred percent? If, if, if I start with five, <laughs> yeah. then, then I go oh, I'll change this thing to a hundred. I'd rather yeah. like, I'd rather, I always, you know, I'm going to start with the, 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 the more I like that. I'm going to start doing that. Start. You can always work your way down. <laughs> I like it's that. It's like when we're selling. It's like when I'm selling any other product. Like I'm yeah. going to share the most expensive product first. Like, okay, we got all different types of range of products with my coaching and our investing. Okay, I'm going to start it. You want to write an $8 million equity check into our project? I'm going to work my way down. And then maybe they want to, maybe I'll find out, okay, mm-hmm. they, this person is only ready for my $36 book. Mm. Right. But I'd rather start high than work and work my way down when I'm selling something. And so it's the same thing. I mean, that's that's essentially starting high at 100 percent. And then I'd work my way down. I love that. We got a seller financing on our hotel project up north. And one thing that, you know, I think the coolest thing about the seller finance deal and, and this gentleman as well is when you return his money and you show him what you did with his property that he was not able to do over the last 20, 30 years he's going to give you that money right back to you when you pay yeah, him off. For and sure. he's, they, now he's going to be one of your biggest investors. They definitely could. Which is sure. pretty cool. No doubt you know? about it. No yeah. doubt about it. So anyway, so this other deal, what's the other one that's well, on so the table? Another with one the, that's like 50 units that my, my offer out to them uh, was initially just a standard deal, like around 3.2 million. Oh. <laughs> and and uh, I didn't think that was going to fly because it was kind of a low ball. He came back. We can't make it work for under four. I'm like, all right, I'll give you four. So I wrote up an LOI because I like to get shit on paper, right? And the guy's, you know, a lot of people don't like LOIs, but at least it's something in paper. They can hold it. They can look at it. So I, I wrote up, I adjusted the LOI and I sent them, I gave them $4 million bu- or a $4 million price, $100,000 earnest money, and then $3.9 million seller financing. How come you didn't ask for the 100% this time? Uh, 
because well he had already said we're not interested in seller financing okay, got it, got so it, got i still it. put but he but uh, so then that's when i said okay here's the offer for 3.2 no seller finance well that was too low they want four million so now i send the offer back and i say hey if we want four million we got to do some seller financing here if we're going to play ball love that so i just started at the hundred thousand or you know earnest money to to show a little bit more good faith on my end and uh 3.9 million and um some other pretty good ter- favorable terms for us as buyers and uh they got back to us and said we're too old to do seller financing we don't and i'm like well it doesn't have to be that long and if you don't want to do seller financing i can probably play ball at like three six three seven i'll get you so i gotta still go back and get him a, another counter offer and stuff i'm gonna do that probably on the plane back tonight but but that's one like we're in like there's no been we're, we're both still going back and forth trying to find a way to make make something work i'm interested to see how this shakes out because i mean you meant they mentioned they're old but it's like man if i'm old and and i'm not going to do anything with that money i'd rather have the cash flow yeah. because they could live off of right. that, you know, potentially, right. and then lowers their tax burden. Right. I um, mean, I almost want to send something back and say, hey, look, I'll give you $5 million, but I'm going to pay you over 150 years. Hmm. That's some, that's some <laughs> uh, like, that's some guys, creative <laughs> finance, like Pace Morby stuff. I, I'm not going to really do that, but, but that's, <laughs> but that's an extreme example of being creative. Yeah. So like if someone wants whatever price and they can be crazy as hell, where like you think it's only worth five million and they want ten, okay, well I'll give you ten, but again, I'm gonna pay it over three hundred years. Yeah. Exactly. Extreme example, but that's how you can understand creativity. Mm-hmm. There's always a creative way to get any deal done. And I think that's what I love most about real estate is, you know, I feel like the deal, the the art of the deal, when you're under contract. The deal really doesn't start to me until there's a road bump, until someone says no. Yeah. And then it's like, okay, how do I turn this no into a yes? Right. And I feel like that's the name of the game. And, and usually it's, you're not really going to turn, well, and how you turn that no into a yes is you change some of the terms you or you know, whatever, right? There's yeah. a, there's a, you're never going to actually convince them. No. You, something's got to change, right? Yeah. It's like, okay, what can we change? What can we maneuver, right? And if it's going to be on price, then it's like, what terms could change? You know, what? What can you do from that standpoint? So there's always ways to make things work. It's just, again, yeah, how creative can you be? And yeah. that's what I tell people all the time. The, the the people that I coach and work with, I'm like, it's a blank slate. Like, it is a blank slate. You can structure the equity. You can structure the deal. Like, however, there's no written rule. Mm-hmm. As long as both parties are good and you can make a deal, there's no written rule. And you can be as creative as you want. And I think that's what I like most about commercial real estate is – you have so many different levers to pull in terms of creative financing to where on the residential side, a lot of these, you know, Fannie Freddie conforming residential loans, it's like they're so cookie cutter. But, you know, commercial real estate, you can do seller finance, you can do all sorts of different things. Um, you could do a master lease and, you know, buy the property a little bit later. Like there's so many different things that you can utilize, which is why I love the commercial real estate space. You know, I'm curious, what what would you tell someone new right now? that was just getting into real estate investing, maybe they wanna go take down their first multifamily deal. Would you suggest for them to go take down something small with their own money? The, the, or would you so say, hey, go a little bit bigger and raise money? The first thing I would tell them is like, get started like right like ASAP. Because you have a lot of big players sitting on the sideline, a lot of medium, I mean, all types of players sitting on the sidelines not doing anything right now. Mm-hmm. That'd be the first thing, like get, know how to do this thing and learn as, as fast as you can and get in the game because the next two years you're going to have great opportunity if you can just get in the game and 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 then i would just say get your foot in the door i i don't i mean whether that's a four unit or an eight unit or a 12 unit obviously the more the better but just get your foot in the door yeah those are those, that's it so just do your first deal yep the next two would be then make sure that deal is cash flow positive day one with a good debt product and you have ability to increase that value of the property and increase the cash flow. That'd be that's like it right now. Yeah. Get started now. Find a deal that's cash flow positive day one with good solid debt structure and cash flow positive day one and it um and then find a way to be able to add that value. And if you can find that, are you saying someone new should be able to go raise the money or would you say use your own money? Close however you however beg, you want. borrow, steal to yeah. I'm I'm still on I still think like long term, there's still there's still a lot of inflation that's gonna happen through oh, 2028 sure. to 2029, 2030. I agree because you pump that much money in the like that all has not come through yet. Now, you can do whatever you want with rates, but the value of these assets, like long term, are still gonna be there. Mm-hmm. So you just gotta be able to figure out how to weather the storm right now and and select the right product and debt products and find something that's cash flow positive. And and again, right now it's easier to find things that are cash flow positive because of what from what I'm seeing, talking to the people I'm talking to. 
things are starting to change where sellers are understanding things are different than a year and a half ago. That was not the case three months ago. If I were sitting here, I, my, my advice would be like, dude, sit and wait. Like three months ago, I'd say, learn, 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 learn because your time's coming. Now your time is starting to be here. Like right now, the clock started to tick for the next, whether that's 18 month window, 24, 36 month window, whatever it might be. But then again, we're going to hit, we're going to hit the same thing. It's going to happen in 2026, 2027, 2028, somewhere in there, it's going to be even crazier hot, in my opinion, than 2020, 2021 were. And I mean, then, imagine what the rents are going to be then, four or five years and from then, now. But then what I think is, I think there's a disaster coming between 2029 and 2032, somewhere in there. Like a like Great Depression, disaster, disaster. Where do you see this? You know, obviously we're going to slow down right now and uh, things are tightening. Where do you see this current cycle that we're in right now? And how do you see it unfolding? I don't know. That's why That's why. if I can buy a deal cash flow positive day one right now that has a five year, I think it's going to be, I think for sure we're through this thing in like by 2025. Mm-hmm. Like I, I for sure think that the 20, the, the latest at the end of 2025, right? Mm-hmm. So that's why if you can find something that has at least five year debt, that's cash flow positive day one where you can increase value and just focus on that. You don't have to tell the future. If I could actually know that, Obviously, anybody sitting here could actually just tell you, like, and, and again, I, that that's that's what I think right there. Yeah, because that's what I'm doing. Well, you're already seeing a lot of the big institutional f- players. You already seeing them uh, bringing in a lot, billions and billions of dollars of capital, and they're gearing up. Yeah. They're getting ready to buy. So, I, I don't, I, I, I would be shocked if this thing went into like 2025. I, I feel like the Fed really has all the control right now. But like you said, none of us really know. Um, but all we can do is control what we can control. We can buy good deals. We can add value, secure long-term debt. Um, I don't think it's going to 2025 either, but yeah. I'm conservative. So again, I sure. go back to how I conservatively underwrite, and I'd rather plan for it going through 2025 of course. than it not, right? So that's the only It'll be I interesting that. to see where this kind of bottoms out. Um, I was actually shocked to see the median uh, home sale prices in like a lot of these markets kind of near us that we're looking in. Um, how much they've actually come back just in the last like eight months. Cause I feel like, I don't know, just, you know, walking around town and just talking to people that are in the game. I'm like, I didn't realize that the discounts were this significant, but they're out there. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. But if you would have told me, you know, a year and a half ago, two years ago, when we were buying those Freddie floaters, that the interest rate would go up this much and the real estate uh, industry would be relatively untouched at this point, I would have been shocked. Yeah. So I, I had them going up in our floaters. I had our rates sure. going up, but, but not, not this much. <laughs> not, 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 and it's not even. I, I don't know. I mean, it might be to this total amount, but not in the time frame that it. Not in the Dude, s- such a short time frame that it. No did. one had any heads up. Right? It was just like, hey, we're coming, and yeah. we're gonna run you over right now. Yeah, but it's just really funny because you pump that much money, and then you think changing interest rates ultimately is gonna do it. Uh, yeah, it's gonna slow things down, but it's like I don't know. I mean, things didn't inflate to the point. With, it doesn't equate to how much money you increased into the money supply yet. Mm-hmm. No, it does not. Right? So I, I look at that and I just, I'm like, I, I, and there's still so much money out there on the private side that, you now the Fed's also letting money roll off its balance sheet, right? Which in the, theory means there's going to be less liquidity from a debt standpoint out there. Yes. Which that's scary because things, that's what happened in, you know, 07, 08, 09, things dried up so fast. And so does that also catch up where things start to, the it starts to roll off their balance sheet and now, it, it dries up because if it dries up, then it's scary because now it's just now you have higher interest rates, but also a lot less debt that's available. Yeah, but they can reverse that pretty quickly. You know? Yeah, but but if it catches you in the wrong window, the, the wrong 90 day window when you have to refi, like I know a great operator that they have like 30,000 units. They've lost two assets ever and it happened in an 07, 08, 09 mm. in those apartments. He's like, we never missed a debt payment, but everything dried up so fast. We just could we literally couldn't get any more debt. The debt came due. The balloon payment came due. And there was no way to refi. There was no way There was no re- way to refi. And, and on top of that, the lender that they had got bought out by someone else that kind of probably acted more as a shark. Mm. And, and it was so dry out that they couldn't even go to another party in that 90-day window to get any money because it was just nobody was doing anything. Not even private money, huh? Well, private money at that point was because there's a lot different scenario than right now. Yeah. We, we, so like you got to understand, in 2020, all this money was pumped into the system. That didn't happen before 07, 08, 09. True. It started happening in 2012. They started the QE1, QE2. So they started doing that in the teens. And then 2012, you know, whenever that started, I can't remember if it was 2010 or 2012, whatever. But they didn't, that was after, not before. And if mm-hmm. you hear the years, it's a year or two years, not in a three month period. And they got caught in the wrong 90 day window 
at the wrong time. And that's that's something that could trip up even someone that has a really good property right now. If if the Fed rolls off enough on their balance sheet, if things were to dry up to that standpoint, you could lose a really good asset just because of the timing of when your debt expires. Yeah. It, it will be interesting to see how this shakes up. I mean, I, I know there's been a lot of tightening right now, but you know, when I walk around, you know, in this neighborhood, for example, Little Italy, which is like one of the trendier neighborhoods in San Diego, it's got all yeah, it's got all the um, you know, the coolest restaurants and like all the best restaurants in, in town are here. But when I go out, I mean, I even go out on like a weekday night. You'll see tonight, it's a Wednesday, but you can't even I can't even get in a restaurant on a Monday night. I crazy. can't even get a table, you know. And so like, man, like I know there's a lot of tightening, there's a lot of layoffs, but like people I'm not still have I'm, money. people still have money. People haven't dude, we've got people, we've got maybe two percent of our portfolio. They've been getting a check from the government to pay their rent since over the last 24 months. And and it got to the point with maybe a quarter of those people where the government would pay their rent up to what they were due. They might have owed us three thousand dollars or whatever. Then they'd also we'd also get a check for the future three to six months. Whoa. Yeah. Say that one more time. We got people. Now this is this is done in Wisconsin because you had to have the absence. We're still getting some money from uh the emergency rent relief programs or whatever, mm-hmm. right? We had people that owed us three thousand dollars, and it got to the point where our team was lackadaisical, not not evicting these people because like, oh, they're just gonna get support because they've been getting support since twenty twenty. So finally, four months ago, I said, guys, this stops. Like, we need to get our shit together because when this is done, it's gonna be done, and mm-hmm. we're gonna be left holding the bag. Two weeks ago, it's done. Any application that what? So we got we got everything in, whatever, and our applications are in. So now we're all good because we're gonna get paid on those applications. But let me go back to what I was saying. So if someone owed us three thousand dollars, they're still living with us. They would go apply for the rent assistance. They would get the three thousand dollars covered, and then they'd get their next three to six months covered as well. If if today is February, that means they would get their back rent from from December all the way from November or December through now paid. But they'd also get a check. We would also get a check from them, so they'd now have a credit for the next three months out to if today's February, today's February, right? out to mm-hmm. May, the wow. rent's covered. And that check's going directly to you, or and it's if going that's to the going rest. It's going on in Wisconsin. It's, it's definitely going on in California and San Diego. Where oh, we're sitting sure. right now. dude, it's crazy out here, man. There's 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 books that you guys are dedicated. So left, it's just crazy. Yeah, there's like squatting out here is a it's a real thing. Oh, for sure, yeah. Um, there's literally like books out there dedicated on how to live rent free and like skip the system and live in a new place every like six to nine months. It's, it's nuts. Yeah, and it's, and it and it doesn't look promising. You know, I mean, I think the real estate industry obviously has a really good lobbying. You know, we have a a, a great uh, lobbying organizations and you know, all that stuff. But like you look at some of the stuff and it's just like they're how I mean, I was talking with one of our guys that lives in L.A. He's invested in three or four of our deals. And there's a guy that he invested in with a deal in L.A. Mm -hmm. The GP in that deal has 30 million dollars in the deal. The guy I was talking to has like 400,000 or something. They have not been able to like evict people, haven't been able to get them out of their apartments because like the municipality, the town, whatever, not working with them. Like it's taken them so long, they might lose the entire deal because of that. Wow. It's crazy, man. The bureaucracy and red tape here in places like California, places like New York. And then I think LA LA also, I think, has something too. If you increase someone's rent more than 10% or something, you yeah. have to pay for their moving expenses or whatever. And I mean, you look at some of this stuff and it's like, man, it's crazy. Yeah. It's scary. A lot of rent control, all sorts of stuff. I will say the cool thing about like San Diego, although we are a blue state, uh, San Diego is one of the more uh, kind of conservative areas of all of California. Uh, which you guys is kind have of, a mayor that's conservative? Yes, I believe so. I don't know or too much the about the mayor maybe. here. Yeah. Um, but it is like known to be a little bit more conservative area yeah. relative to yeah. the San Francisco's of the yeah. world and in the Los Angeles's of the world. But yeah, it'd be interesting to see. I mean, we, we California, I saw, I saw an article that came out recently. It was on a, it was on CoStar, but it was talking about like the states in 2022 that had the most population increases and in, uh, net migration, and then uh, the states that had the most people leave. And I saw like Florida was number one. I think they had like something crazy, like 330,000 people moved net migration positive right. in 2022 alone. Well, a lot of that's because they got, you know, they got great politics over there that are business friendly, no state income tax, and you got the warm weather, of course, and you have a lot of people retiring and moving down there, I get that. But then on the flip side, uh, one of the states that lost the most people, and this has got to do be due to the politics and also mm-hmm. the the cost of living, is due to, uh, you know, it, it was California. Yep. And so why are people leaving? Well, it's the, the price of housing, but why is the price of housing up here 
very expensive. Part of it is the politics because it's so damn it's hard, hard to build to push permits and through to build here. And it costs a lot to push yeah. those permits through. It's and a all lot. extra fees, and all the extra lot. taxes, and all the extra. I'm going through the permitting process right now on a property here in San Diego. They said it'd be six months to build an ADU, accessory dwelling unit, which um, the, the California basically installed this like new you know policy recently and said this is a couple of years back to where if you want to build an apartment unit on your lot, as long as your lot is big enough, they'll push this through in six months. Hmm. Well, it's been 19 months now and we're still waiting on permits. That's crazy. That's insane. <laughs> and so they wonder why it's so expensive here. And yeah. that's part of the reason. Yeah. They just It's impossible to build. Which Madison is actually uh, like almost a mini San Francisco, very liberal politics. Is it really? Yeah. yeah I didn't realize liberal. you guys were blue over there. Yeah. Is the whole state? It, it's a purple state. So we go back and forth. Okay. You guys are swingers. Yes, there's swingers. But when you look at the city of Madison and, and Dane County, which is where I live, um, very blue. Very, 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 like a, literally like a mini San Francisco. Uh, Milwaukee, the same thing, liberal. But then everything else. They, they don't like landlords but then like everything you. else in, right, yeah. But then everything else in, um, now it's still relatively easy for us to evict compared to out here. So mm -hmm. that stuff hasn't changed yet. But everything else they're very liberal on. But then everywhere else in Wisconsin, very, very red. So, I mean, you get places in Wisconsin, like Dane County and Milwaukee County, they are like 70% blue, but then the rest of the state combined is like 70% red, which That's is pretty, crazy. It's very interesting and crazy. Yeah, it so, is crazy to think about. Uh, it's a battleground state for sure as of late. Yeah, interesting. I think we went Trump and, and 16, and then the last time we went Biden, and then uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens this next time. So I wanted to go back uh, the advice on if people should raise money from other investors or not. Yeah. So I, I, I believe in both, right? I think like if you can have streams of both where you get some deals rolling by yourself, I think that's great. Uh, and then I think you should also look at doing some syndications too if you're starting. And I, I guess the reason I say it is because there's a lot of upside in that comes with that, right? Now there's a lot of responsibility, but there's also a lot of upside. And so this 372 unit deal that we closed in May of last year, we bought for 41 million. Uh, we are like absolutely crushing it over there. Like just unreal, on fire, Love that. I think I can't remember if I put three hundred thousand into that one or what I put personally put into that one, but like my that 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 my money, how we do things, and you can structure these things however you want. But my money is treated just like our investors' money, so my money will probably three to four x on the pace that we're on right now over the seven years that we're going to hold this deal will three to four x. But and you're investing with the LPs, yeah. So as my an money, LP. that's yeah, impressive. So my money, so what you make, they my make. money's treated. Yeah, my money's yeah. treated just like my money. Mm -hmm. My my family's money, uh, my mother in law's money is treated just like any other investor's LP yeah. money. Now, me as the GP, I get obviously the promotes, right? So I basically am getting compensated off the performance for the people that aren't following. Some we're talking to beginners right now when we're talking, right? So I get paid for the performance of of the LPs, the limited partners' investment. So the better the investment does for them, the more that I, the more of a split of the remaining cash I get after they get paid. Mm -hmm. Well, this deal, I'm looking at this deal now, and I thought, you know, when I first put the deal together, I'm like, man, we'll probably, you know, we bought it for 41, seven years from now, we might be able to sell this for like 55. Like the rate we're going right now and like with what we're doing there, like I, I won't be shocked if we have a shot at going to $70 million on this thing before it's said and done. If we do that, the upside that I'm going to get from that portion is like 13 to 15 million bucks. Learning to become a successful real estate investor can take a lot of time and dedication, which some people just don't have. If you're one of these individuals, this doesn't mean you can't invest in real estate. My company, Summers Capital, is buying a bunch of boutique hotels right now, and you can invest with us in these deals without having to do any of the work. Our team sources the deals, we secure the lending, we take care of all the renovations, and we even handle all the day-to-day -day operations with our in-house management company, making it truly hands-off and passive for our investors. If you want to learn more to see if we can help you, go to Summers summerscapital.com slash invest to book a call with our team. Again, that's summerscapital.com slash invest. Now back to the show. What's your highest promote in that deal? Is it 50-50? Yeah, so that one we're set up. Most of our deals are set up 6% preferred return, mm -hmm. then a 70-30 split, 70% to the investors, 30% to the GPs. How and, many hurdles do you have? And then and then we uh and then it's it's that hurdle up to 12% for the LP, and then it's 50-50 with everything left in that deal. Okay. So it's lucrative, right? And so that's why I said, you know, we were talking in the other room, or I don't remember where we were, we were talking about that on the podcast from the room. The conference room. Okay. Yeah. So I said, I said something about being able to be worth, you know, $250 million or whatever. Like, I mean, I, I think like after some of these first deals go, I'm, is going to set me up to become a billionaire mm. because of the profits and the promote, the promotes, the profits, interest and the promotes that I'm going to get from some of these deals that we bought off market that we are absolutely crushing on is going to pay me 
tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars, if not by the time it's said and done, over 100, 150 million dollars. If I keep doing that, like that 150, I'm confident I can 10x that 150 oh, for sure. after that. And you have the biggest asset on your side right now, which is time. And so to think that you're at right, 1,800 I'm units. I was calculating. Yeah, that. you're at 1,800 units. And when all these deals blossom uh, down the road, you're going to be set up in a position to where it's going to be hard to fuck it up. You know what yeah. I mean? And yeah. And that's impressive, man. It, we have kudos a, we have you. I mean, a, think, uh, think about. I would say 75% of our properties right now are, we're in a position of it's hard to fuck up. Mm -hmm. Probably, maybe, maybe even a little bit more yeah. than that. But to think about, you know, the people that you look up to, um, you know, like the Grant Cardones of the world, to think, I mean, I always compare myself to, to people that are above me, right? Yeah. And they inspire me. And I, sometimes I get caught up in like comparing, but sometimes I got to remember or remind myself like, hey, you know, Grant Cardone's 62 years old or 63 years yeah, old. Yeah, something like that, yeah. Justin Spaulding is 30, 33 years old, Yeah, you yeah. know? And so to think that you have, man, he has 30 years on you. Yep. And where was where was Grant Cardone at thirty three? You're well ahead of him. I was I was on an Instagram you know live I mean? with him like two or three years ago, something like that. He's like, dude, you're at three hundred. It was when I was at three hundred units. Remember how that was? He's like, dude, you are. He's like, you're thirty five years ahead of me. He's like, you don't realize that. And I, I thought about that because I was twenty eight at that time. So this was five years ago. I was twenty eight at that time. I'm like, oh holy shit! Like I, I'm. So as long as I can get, as long as we can keep. Now the most the most risky time in real estate is when is your first year owning a deal first year to 18 months because there's always something you've been doing this long enough there's always something that you don't find in due diligence that goes sideways that you have to figure out how to operate through mm -hmm. you right? don't know you don't know so and that's where you were that's where you just said you know you get far enough along in some of these real estate deals they're really hard to mess up yeah and, and that's, you have and the team you wrapped around you yeah. you got the management company in-house and i think once you get to a certain point like you alluded to you just have that team wrapped around you and so many good people around you, it's really hard to screw it up, yeah. you know? But it's also a testament to real estate, right? You know, look at all the, the companies that are doing layoffs right now. Most of them are not real estate investing yeah. firms. Yeah. They are tech companies yeah. that were built around tech and a lot of hypothetical stuff that's going on. But a lot of those spaces have a lot of competition right now. Yeah. And because technology is evolving so quickly, it's like you're seeing a lot of these companies boom and then they bust yep. the Kodaks of the world, the yep. Blackberries of the world. But apartment buildings, they're time tested, they're evergreen. Yep. There's never gonna be a replacement for two things, a place for people to sleep and a place for people to store their belongings. Yep. That's never gonna go anywhere. No matter where technology goes, people are always gonna need a place to sleep and that's never gonna go anywhere, which is why I think multifamily is one of the best risk adjusted return investments yep. that you could make. Yep. Well, that's, this is why it goes full circle, right? And so I need my I need my operations team and my management company to have the resources because I need to keep doing this at scale because I truly believe like th these round of properties that we have, once I get that first 150 million, 100 to 150 million, which I know is coming, mm -hmm. I'm going to be able to 10x that number. I, I have no doubt about it. What are you going to do with that I money? I started with $40,000 10 years ago. What are you going to do with the 150? I'm, I'm going to, I'm going all the way back in and on deals. Yeah. So now the thing is, you're going to, you're going to go now, back, you're going to go back to zero. Lever leveraging up into into bigger stuff. I, I don't I don't know for sure what that exactly yeah. looks like. But you're gonna put it to work. But 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 my mindset is okay. If I can raise, if right now, by me putting in anywhere you know between two hundred to seven hundred thousand dollars a deal, whatever. If I can raise twenty million dollars doing that, what happens when I have hundred and fifty million bucks and I can put in twenty million dollars my own money? Oh, for sure. Right. And so I, I think that that I'll, I'll be able to really scale that at that point. It doesn't necessarily mean that we take on as much debt on each of these deals or, you know, whatever. But if, if, if there's deals and there's opportunities the way that we're doing now, I wouldn't have a problem because I view the deals that we're buying to be valued way higher than because of the, how much cash flow they're throwing off day one. Mm -hmm. They're throwing off significant amounts of cash flow day one. And we have huge, I mean, this, this, even it's a small scale, the 18 unit I'm talking about, I mean, $600 a month rents. We're gonna go through new flooring, you know, the updates and all that stuff. They're going to eleven hundred, a thousand to eleven hundred. The the three hundred seventy two unit deal that I just used as an example of, we took those rents from between six fifty up to uh, nine fifty. Between the, that's where all the rents were when we closed, and there we're getting between eleven hundred up to fourteen hundred for some of the townhome type units. And it was cash flow positive day one. Yeah, and that that deals in a variable rate loan. We don't even notice it because of we're out how fast we're outpacing the the our revenue. Like we're outpacing the interest rate. And it's crazy to hear like those rents that you're throwing out. This is a Midwest market, you know, yeah. uh, that Tight you're supply. in. And you're talking fourteen, fifteen hundred dollar rents. Cool. Now, here's the other here's the other thing too, is is a lot of what we've bought lately, it's townhome style. Yeah. 
which people love these days. So attach, we're talking like attached garages, like, mm -hmm. and we're talking like these property, like at scale townhomes, mm -hmm. you know? And so for the listener out there, townhome just means there's no one above or below you, but you might have some shared well, walls. Yeah. So some of them are, I guess I should say more of private entrance. Okay. It's townhome feel because sure. there are some that are still two story, but you have a, you still have a garage. You just go up the steps right from the yeah, garage. Nice. But people love but that. So Great for families. Pr private entrance. There's no common areas yeah. to take care of, you know, none and of that probably stuff. less turnover with your tenants, so, right? So they're bigger units. So you hear these rent amounts. I mean, we're not, we're not sure. talking necessarily an 800 square foot apartment. I mean, some of the, some of the stuff. What that kind we of have, price per square foot are we talking? Just for reference. Uh, okay, yeah, that's great. So when we buy these deals, literally we'll buy them, and they're anywhere from 75 cents to a dollar a square foot. And you know you can take them to. And we know that we can, depending on again unit type. If it is apartment, now again this includes apartments mm -hmm. and townhomes. So if it's apartment, if it's townhome, where it's at, whatever, we're taking stuff up to a dollar twenty, up to a dollar sixty four a square foot. How much uh, ideally, when you guys buy a, pr a property a reposition, ideally, what's your bread and butter in terms of how much improvement dollars you're going to put in per unit? Typically. Typically, we like to be around about five thousand dollars, and that includes exterior work or just interiors That's only. That's just kind of interiors. Okay. So then, exterior just kind of depends, right? Sure. Because they come in like we got the four hundred sixty units. Only like sixty four of those units really need exterior work. The rest of them, like the seller, did a fantastic job taking care of the place. Sure. Um, what What do you guys typically like to do the exteriors? I mean, pretty basic. Give Give us some good tips and tricks. Like, like if, what is if, What are some if, good if ones? If you roll up into a property and you know, like we have a lot of trees in Wisconsin, right, and beautiful grounds and stuff like that, but you can tell when trees haven't been like maintained or like the land, like so we'll trim up trees so that they're trimmed up higher, so you can actually kind of see like the yard and the landscape. Otherwise, there's like branches at like the height of six feet, right? So yeah. we trim those things up so you don't have branches for the first you know, 15 to 20 feet and we prune them, make Increase them look the visibility. nice. Yeah. Okay. Pull out the dead stuff, mm -hmm. trim up the stuff that's right along the house and make it look better, throw down mulch. I mean, it's not crazy. We're not doing crazy stuff. What about, the top stuff. what about new signage and new lighting and all that sort of thing? That's the crazy thing is we basically, some of these properties, we just go and put a new phone number on the, on the sign. Wow. I, I mean, so it's bread. It's like, I think sometimes people make it so complicated. Now yeah. I could be wrong there, sure. right? I'm not saying I'm right there, mm -hmm. but some of these, I think some people go overboard when like you just don't need to sometimes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, that's how we've rolled. And what about interiors? What are you typically doing? You mentioned $5,000 a unit. What are you doing and with the $5,000? Sometimes we have the driveway stuff that we have to take care of. Sometimes you got roof. Yeah. Sometimes you got some siding. Like windows. a seal and stripe for the yeah, parking lot. I mean, sometimes you got to do that stuff and you just, you yeah. get it, make sure it's in your CapEx budget. I think what, the siding and the windows is a nice touch that, that really turns the appearance from the curb around and, from the street view when you roll up to the property. Yeah, so we really I think we take care of that, a lot of that part with the landscaping mm -hmm. portions. We if we're doing siding and or windows, it's because they're in such bad shape or there's a utility savings or whatever. So a lot of the stuff that we're buying, you know, we're not buying a type stuff. It's more of like a taking stuff that's like a C plus and t moving it to a B. Okay. So that's that's when we get in it. Now like roofs, we'll redo roofs obviously if they need to be redone, right? And and then what we'll do is if any like if we got a pro like the deal we closed in May, there was, let's just, one of the properties, this was a portfolio that we bought. One of the properties is like 20 buildings. We were initially just going to do like two roofs, but then the guy that we use all the time is like, dude, these other ones you're going to need to do in like the next three years. I'm like, all right, if we do all these right here, what pricing discount can you get us? We can get you about 12% off. All right, let's just knock them out. Don't have to worry about it. I like that. Right? So we just knocked it out. Yeah. That's kind of how I am when I do these deals. I'm like, let's just, you know, if we got to do 70% of these repairs or improvements, let's just do 100% now. And we're not going to have to come back to it a couple of years from now and patch it up. You yep. know what I mean? I like I like it, just taking that approach. So with the five k per unit, what's your bread and butter with it with the interior renovation package? I would say I would say appliances, and that depends. You know, sometimes are you going black to stainless, or are you just going white to black? What are you sometimes, doing? Sometimes sometimes it's just all new white. It depends on the okay. property. It depends on the area. Okay. Sometimes we're going stainless. Sometimes we're just going all white. Okay. And then you know, flooring. We're we're usually doing LVP for sure in all the living areas, kitchens. Bedrooms, we still seem, I don't know, for some reason, I feel like, and maybe this is just me, I still like a carpeted bedroom. So I feel like that's where I've just kept I think it. that's just you. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so, so, because uh, you can always, so like, because you can do the LVP in the bedroom and then, you know, if the, the resident they, wants, they throw a rug down, throw a nice rug yeah, down. And, yeah. and from an aesthetic standpoint, it yeah. photographs well. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. So, so we still, for the most part, we're still doing, at most of our probably still do carpet in the, okay. uh, in the bedrooms. And then, um, and then again, new paint. What and, about the kitchens? Most of what we've bought in the last two years, we've done very, the only reason that we'd be doing um, a full cabinet tear out and replace mm -hmm. is if they're completely shot. We've done, we've done a handful and we are going to do a handful of uh, re like refacing. 
Yeah, but they're just like new doors yeah. and new hardware. But a lot of what we've been able to buy has been in good enough shape and just like, again, so far under market that we can just kind of push it to market by improving the product, improving the service, get in and get, you know, when we when we go into these deals, for example, this 372 units, when people saw that we were on roofs, tearing stuff off and doing new driveways and fixing mm-hmm. up and cutting limbs off and cutting down bad trees and dead trees and all that stuff, work orders came out of the woodwork. I mean, we yeah. had like, we got to the point where we had like 480 work orders come in and obviously they didn't, all that stuff didn't break just now. It's stuff that hadn't been taken care of the last 10 years. So just by starting to get in and knocking those out, people start to see the value as well. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think you got to think about the residents that live there. You know, if the, the seller was a, a, you know, a slumlord and there was all this broken stuff that was not getting fixed. And then now a new operator comes in and they're fixing everything up. Uh, especially if those tenants got kids and families. I mean, that's pretty cool if you fix up their unit for them and give them a nice, safe, clean operating unit to live in um, or to raise their family in for that yep. that matter. Um, I think that's a cool thing. And there's a little bit of a feel good about doing that. Would you yep. agree? Yep. I would, yeah. yeah, I would agree. Yeah, yeah absolutely, man. That's um, that's cool that what you're doing, though, man. It sounds like you're, you're buying cash flow and assets. You're putting a little bit of money into them. Um, you're getting good debt. And you're forcing equity, you're forcing appreciation, but yep. uh, you know you're you're playing the long game there, yep. which I love. Yep, I love. Al- always got to be about the long game. Always what what is your um, what does your wife and and your your family think of all the stuff that you're doing, man? Uh, my, well, my wife, she's she just opened her. She's a dentist, so okay. she just opened her first practice in no August. Way. Yeah. Uh, yep. Like what kind of dentistry? Like cosmetic or more like just uh, she routine stuff? She kind of does it all. Yeah, she's kind of okay. does it all. So she's old school that way, which has been great for her practice because there's a lot of people that only do certain things and refer out like root canals or cosmetic. Yeah. But she does like d- dang near everything. So it's it's been great. And uh, she just hired uh, a second dentist that starts in April or May. And um, so it's a growing growing practice. And uh, it's it's pretty cool because I, you know, she always got it. What, what you have to go through mm-hmm. as an entrepreneur and business owner, but she didn't really get it. And so now sometimes she'll come home like, I just want to like, she wants to bang her head against you know, the <laughs> yeah. microphone, wants to bang her head against the wall or whatever. And I just kind of, there's sometimes like I inadvertently laugh mm-hmm. and now she knows why I laugh because like, it's just, she understands it now. So, you know, she's uh, super supportive. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer of, I think both spouses should make their own money because I think that empowers each other. It doesn't, mm-hmm. Um, I think it's an empowering thing. So like my wife, she's going to put her own money into the, the upcoming deal that we have coming up. And we've gotten my daughter, do- like we've gotten our daughter to understand that. Um, she, ha- any money that she gets, she's got a split that our daughter gets. She's got a split 50, 50. She's got one wallet. That's her spend, whatever, spend that cash flow on whatever you want. That's what you could do with that 50%, but 50% of everything that you get, you got to save and invest in our deals. So like right now she gets $18 a month cash flow. Nice. She split, she takes nine and can spend it on whatever she wants and she blows it really fast all the time. I say, hey, good for you because you're yeah. going to get another 18 bucks next month. This other 50%, this $9 you got to save up. And now she's getting pissed at me because I haven't bought anything since August. So between like birthday money and all this stuff, she's got like $300. She's ready to there. rock. So she's ready to roll. <laughs> so then this next deal, I said, hey, we're going to sign a contract. You're going to help me do some underwriting. You're going to come to the property with me. You're going to, you, she has these certain tasks that she's got to accomplish. We're going to pay her 1500 bucks. She's got to invest all of the entire fifteen hundred bucks, and then when she gets the cash flow from it, again, same game, fifty fifty. You split it. I right? love that. So teaching kids how to earn passive income, yeah. man. So some days she Something loves the school it. system doesn't do. Some some days she <laughs> loves it. Some days she hates me for it. Some days it creates tears. But it's it's all about that learning process, and it's it's pretty cool because like even even though you don't think that they're really maybe getting it or understanding it, then they say something like they listen to everything that you say and they she she gets it she understands it and that's pretty cool yeah. so so i have a ton of support you know for my wife with what i do and you know um and and i mean that's awesome because i mean for my mom and dad too and i get it not everyone has that i'm super lucky that i was yeah. raised the way i was and had the support my dad as busy as he was running his business uh and being a veterinarian like he missed one football game my entire career from first grade all the way through my senior year of college and, and in college, we played all across the country. We, we had games all across the country. He missed one game, right? So I had super supportive parents. My, my mom loved riding horses, you know, and she gave that up for 15 years. So when I started to have some success here, we've invested in some of her, her mm-hmm. horse projects, which has been cool, like in, in investment horses and stuff like that. Because, again, it was all about us, right? Now it's the same thing as, you know, getting married and we're coming up on a three-year anniversary. It's, it's awesome to be able to have that support from my wife. Because, again, a lot of people, but that's also why I waited. 
Yeah. Until I was, th- I didn't get married until I was 30, 30, you know, whatever, 31 or whatever I was. And because. How long I, were you, have you guys been dating? Uh, five years. Okay. But, you know, I, I just, you, you, it's, it's important that you have the right person because it's, it's not easy and it's hard. And it's not that, I mean, as much as I'm saying we're supportive of each other, there's still, there's still days where like we're frustrated with each other because of whatever at work or, you know, whatever. Yeah. But that's just, it's a part of it. But to, for the majority of the time, uh, 99.9% of the time to have the full out, 100% support is huge. Yeah, absolutely. And somehow it's, people got to be able to find that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I say it all the time. Like, you either want a spouse that's going to be, you know, not in it with you, but fully supporting you, 100%. or they're going to be in the trenches with you, yep. building the business. Yep. But what you can't have is someone that's not doing it with you and they're not supporting yep. you. Yeah. Uh, that's just you, not going to work. No, not going to yeah. work at all. Well, brother, dude, it's been a pleasure, yeah, man. I could co- I could conversate with you I all know, day long. I know, yeah. Um, I appreciate you coming on the show and, and yeah, keep doing you. what you're doing, yep. man. I'm a, I'm a big fan. Yep. Same to you, buddy. Yeah. Let's go. Uh, let's go hit this real estate meetup, let's, man. Let's do it. I appreciate you coming on, listeners. Thank you for tuning in. Till the next one. Peace.